Hello and welcome back to Like Maria. Today we're going to look at Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot and in particular we're going to look at Lucky's speech. So by the end of this presentation you'll be able to analyse Lucky's speech just like Maria. So you may know that Lucky speech is one of the most difficult passages from this play to perform and to analyse really and to make sense of. I'm sure you're feeling that as you're experiencing either watching or reading the play. Um, I like to think of it um, in terms of this quote by um, critic Anselm Atkins who says it's just like a paper bag full of nonsense water thrown splat in the audience's face. And this is certainly the impression we get when we first go to Waiting for Godot and are overwhelmed um, by what Beckett terms as this tirade. So this word tirade is actually in the stage directions um, and he speaks of Lucky as um, offering to us this rant. And this is quite interesting because Lucky is otherwise a mute character. He's completely silent, he doesn't have any dialogue and it, to us it feels like he's bottled all these words up um, and he is kind of spewing them forth to us. Um, it's a very different part of the play and if you are writing an essay and waiting for Godot you should always consider um, what you can take from this section in the play. Really important to look at stage directions before and after. Um, think about what they've asked Lucky to do. Um, these characters. They've asked him to dance, this wasn't very effective, and now they're asking him to think. So he is performing for them. Initially Estragon and Vladimir are very attentive, um, but then they begin to protest and slight, feel slightly uncomfortable. Pozzo, um, certainly throughout, his sufferings um, are exhibited very physically in the stage directions. He becomes agitated and he groans. And at the end, there is a general outcry and this kind of melee of distress, really, um, at having um, this um, thinking um, being poured out in front of um, these characters on stage. And perhaps us as an audience might um, share in some of this distress. Eventually, Pozzo, who is clearly in control here, shouts out um, for the hat. Um, and then when that's removed, um, the thought pauses, the thought stops, um, which is quite interesting, especially relating back to what we know um, of the hat and its role in Vladimir's character, where he's constantly looking into his hat and um, thinking about things. And we have at the very end here um, this idea about the panting of the victors. They've kind of overcome Lucky and they are cast here by Beckett as the victors, as having squashed thought, as having prevented thought, because thought to them was very painful. So really important here, I think, to consider the audience response, and particularly perhaps going back to the Theatre du Babylon, the initial performances, um, where um, the audience would have been struggling to understand um, this rant. Remember that as literature students we are privileged to be able to study and read this and ponder on the speech. If we are in the auditorium we are simply getting it once. There's no um, ability to pause and consider what's being said here. I think to a certain extent we share the opinion of the characters on stage that initially this seems nonsensical, it's very rapid, it's very loud, um, there's lots of different registers um, reaching uh, from the very sophisticated down to the downright bawdy um, and we become distressed because we can't do what we really are seeking to do is make a sense of this just like the characters in this play are seeking to make a sense of their lives and of the world. I think one really useful way of approaching this speech is to look at the repetition and patterning and I would um, print out the speech for yourself and just underline all the phrases that are repeated and all the different patterns um, that are operating here. Um, a similar thing that you can do is just underline all the proper nouns because this gives us some insight into the different um, parts of the speech where 
um, Beckett is addressing different things. So, for example, he mentions Bishop Berkeley, um, clearly pointing to an exploration of the idea of to be is to be perceived. Um, and then he also mentions these characters, um, Fartov and Belcher, um, clearly quite bawdy, um, referring to um, bodily functions um, and really lowering um, the level of the intellectual um, element of the speech. I think it's very important to look contextually at how Beckett um, viewed this speech. Um, there is much evidence to suggest that he sees it as central to the play. And indeed, in the early days when he was directing Godot, and being very involved with performance, he often insisted on rehearsing Lucky's speech first. Um, and we can see that this speech, um, possibly quite purposely by Beckett, is um, divided into three sections. Um, that is one of um, addressing concerns of God and God interacting with man, um, then man wasting away um, and deterioration, um, and then ultimately the grave and death. And Beckett himself said the threads and themes of the play are being gathered together in this speech. And I think the more that we revisit this speech and look at it, this is certainly true. So we can structure um, by content. As I've said, we have three parts. Um, I would suggest that they would be from given the existence, um, the beginning of the speech where he's talking about the existence of God, man's interaction with God, um, perhaps this character true of God as the uh, white bearded um, male, but also the problematic um, condition um, of God's relationship with humanity um, and concerning suffering and communication. Then we have um, man declining and wasting. Man tries to um, stop this by engaging in lots of sports and tennis and what have you, distractions, but it is um, one of the main concerns of this speech is to illustrate that man wastes and declines away. There's lots of um, imagery of waste here, and in particular human waste and um, this um, imagery pertaining to excretion. And then finally, and considering what is much more grave, in fact, um, the grave and death and the coldness of the stones and the mention of the skull here, rather Hamlet-esque, um, perhaps um, referencing Golgotha, the place of the skull, is where we have arrived at in this speech. Um, so really a good way to um, look at this speech and analyse it is to look at those um, three issues. So in terms of the actual kind of grammatical structure of this piece, um, we have many, many subordinate clauses that are never resolved. So we have given the existence, um, and it just really this goes on and on, and it's not conventional grammar, and I think this is important here, that the syntax um, of each section we can probably work out, um, but it, it doesn't really make much coherent grammatical sense to us. And I think this is looking um, towards those earlier 20th century um, writers, and in particular James Joyce, who we know was a big influence on Beckett, um, and it's challenging the boundaries and the ways that we um, interpret language and produce language here. We also have a parody of a philosophical argument. Um, if you look at the register and the diction, um, the pseudo-Latin, the qua qua qua, the references, um, the balance of phrases, given this, then this. This is philosophical argument and perhaps um, Beckett is suggesting here that time spent on um, philosophical argument really just ends in the same um, result as, as um, for anybody, that um, we waste and waste and pine and then um, we die. And perhaps it's questioning the, the point of these great philosophical arguments. Um, we also have many digressions and um, what we might say non sequiturs um, that um, Lucky starts off on something and then um, lists some noun phrases um, that seem um, quite irrelevant. For example, I resume Fulham Clapham in a word, the dead loss per caput since the death of Bishop Barclay being to the tune of one inch four ounce per caput approximately. So all of this um, just 
moving to different topics, shifting around. Um, it seems like a kind of thought process before somebody has um, turned it into effective communication. Um, I've mentioned the repetitions. I resume, I resume, I resume. I think resuming is a really important repetition here. It links back to the very beginning of the play um, when um, Estragon is struggling with his boot and resuming and the very beginning of Act 2 again where we have the repetition in that song which Vladimir, Vladimir sings and resumes. Um, I've already mentioned the proper nouns so make sure you go and look at all of those and do your research on some of those. Contextually, as I've mentioned, um, this is really important um, to point out that um, Beckett um, was actually Joyce's secretary um, at one time and he, Joyce, was very interested along with others of the early 20th century in the connection between thought and speech and much of his writing and um, in particular in um, Ulysses um, and um, it, of, his, of his works is um, we now describe as this stream of consciousness prose in that he is trying to get into the character's thoughts before um, they have been articulated um, efficiently. So you can see if you click on the link below um, a little bit of what I'm talking about here. So really I guess my focus is here that Lucky Speech is an exploration of what it is to think, the purpose of thinking, um, how important thought is, and how we receive other people's thoughts. Some final points of context here. Beckett sees it essential. Um, the absurd existence is articulated here. The repeated um, ideas and also this phrase, um, for reasons unknown, for reasons unknown. There's a lot of problematic things presented here to us, and I think it is um, reminiscence of this um, greater absurd existence that these characters are living in the play. No questions are answered, and they are constantly resuming and repeating. Um, some further contextual points to link to. Um, Descartes' idea of I think therefore I am, what it is to think and does thinking define yourself? If so, how might um, Lucky be defining himself here? Um, Bishop Barclay, to be is to be perceived and we are perceiving um, Lucky thinking here. Um, so that's just something you might want to develop. And of course the idea of the um, existential um, philosophy of the mid-20th century and how that relates to theatre of the absurd is important, particularly noting that um, Beckett himself was great friends with Camus. Very last slide, um, some useful pointers from Der Dermot Moran um, from his work Beckett and Philosophy and I will just leave you there to read those quotes. Um, I um, particularly like this idea of um, Beckett's writing containing a bricolage of um, philosophical ideas um, and this notion of um, the characters exulting as they sometimes do in endless pointless yet entertaining um, metaphysical arguments and of course that is what we are going to theatre for generally to be entertained and let's not lose sight of that in our quite fastidious study of this as a text that ultimately we would be sitting there um, waiting to be entertained. So that's all on Lucky Speech. I hope um, now that you've got a good grasp of that and you're able um, to write some good suggestions um, about this speech in your essays, just like Maria. Thank you.